So glad that you have joined us for another session of Thursday School. We are so grateful for that. This is your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson, and here we study the international Sunday School lessons, and we have what we call Thursday School, which is Sunday School on a Thursday. <laughs> and we praise God that you joined us for this wonderful study. Amen. Uh, we want to let you know these recordings are available on our YouTube channel and they're on our Facebook page and on Twitter and LinkedIn. And we ask if you would so kindly subscribe to our YouTube channel and like and share this video and like our Facebook page, which will help more people to find us and find the Savior. Will you please do that for us? We would appreciate it so very, very much. We praise God that we are able to study his word together through this particular medium that allows us to come together. And for this, we're glad. Father, we love you and bless you and give you praise. Thank you for your sweet word. Thank you for these Sunday school lessons. Thank you for that team that puts together these lessons years in advance. We're grateful, Lord. Now, Lord, open understanding, teach us your word, help us to become the word we study. We're not studying just for data, just for information, and we're not studying to impress somebody or for argument. We're studying to be made according to the image of your son, shaped and molded by your word. Do it, Lord, we pray. For this, we give you praise. Thank God and amen. Hallelujah. Well, we are grateful that we are continuing our march through not only these lessons, but our Bible Spotlight. And we're continuing to our study on it. If you've missed any of our uh, sessions on the Bible Spotlight over the last couple of few months, please go back and listen again. You're welcome to do so at any time so that you won't miss all of these elements on faith. And uh, today we are covering the second of our third um, uh, types of faith of which the Lord Jesus himself spake. And on last time, we looked at no faith. Uh, being faithless and uh, how significant that is because we know from Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We want to please the Lord, which means we need to be walking by faith and we want our faith to grow. Amen. And so today we want to talk about little faith. <laughs> Lord say the same next time. Great faith. Oh, we want to talk about that. faith. How interesting. There are not very many things that are the, what people would call the Christian graces or the characteristics of the believer where the scripture talks about them in incremental fashion. Uh, we do hear about great joy. Uh, there may be a, a time or two we hear about great peace, but most things they're not spoken of in terms of little and great. Generally, they are characteristics that just should be in our life. But faith is spoken of as no faith or being faithless. It's spoken of of little faith. How interesting. Um, and then great faith. So that being the case, it's really driving home that of all the different Christian graces, we know that in particular, faith is foundational. It's one of those essential things in a foundation of a building, of course, that is necessary to be firm and established, even if other parts of the house are weaker. The windows are quite weak, but we don't say that we don't need windows. They serve their purpose. But the character of the glass is much weaker than the concrete that's in a foundation. That lets us know that the job of the window is very different than the job of the foundation. Well, since faith is that essential element without which we cannot please God, without which we're not even saved, amen? For by grace, Ephesians chapter two, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. So since faith is so essential, it's in the foundation. Well, before we deal with picking out which windows we want for our house, we need to make sure we've got a good foundation. Amen? Faith. So these passages we want to look at today will deal with little faith. Um, and let's turn, if you will. The two we want to look at is um, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30. 
and then Mark chapter 14 and verse 31. So Matthew 6 and 30, I would like to read that to you first. It says here, the Lord Jesus, of course, is speaking, and this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow's cast in the oven. In other words, the sun beats down on the grass and it's gone. So the grass is here today, sun beats down, it dries up and it's gone tomorrow. Here's his question. Will he not much more clothe you? If God clothes grass, which is coming and going, will he not much more make sure you have clothes? And then he asks a question. Oh, ye of little faith. So this is all a, a part of a question. He starts out saying, if God will do this and so and so on in terms of the grass, won't he clothe you? And then adds on there, oh, ye of little faith. This is very significant because as he goes on and time won't allow, you have opportunity, please read the rest of the passage. He starts to then talk about worry. And a few uh, months ago, we had a whole lesson on worry and another lesson on fear and how critical it is that we learn as believers to live without fear or worry in our lives because those both drive us into places God doesn't want us to go instead of the Spirit of God leading us. The Spirit of God as uh, uh, the Spirit of Christ is a shepherding spirit. It leads the sheep. Fear and worry drive us you're not supposed to drive sheep. You drive cattle. You lead sheep. So the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ is a shepherding spirit that leads us. But fear and worry will drive us to places we're never supposed to go in terms of desperation and making bad decisions and doing things we shouldn't do because fear and worry drove us there instead of being led by the Spirit to the places we should go. Amen. And I think you agree with me. We don't want to be driven. And we most certainly don't want these awful destinations where fear and worry would to send us. Jesus now, right after talking about this uh, passage, goes on to talk about worry because worry will do the opposite in our life of what faith will do. This particular area where the Lord is talking about faith has to do with us believing in the fatherhood of God. And as a father, he's our provider. Amen. The Lord will take care of us. Here he's talking about clothing, but there's other things that we need, our essentials, we need food and so on. Uh, and so part of the question here about how is it that you're of such little faith is you don't have confidence in God as your father. Now, how did that happen? Some of it may be that we're new believers. Others of it may be that we just haven't grown in our personal relationship with the Lord. Sometimes we feel like I'm taking care of me. I work every day. I work eight hours. I got my 40 hours a weekend. I buy my clothes. I buy my food. I pay my, my mortgage. I take care of my, my car. And I'll, we have put so much confidence in ourselves that we're not putting proper confidence in God. Because yes, we should uh, be diligent and take care of our business and you know pay our bills and whatever. But the Lord is the ultimate provider because he's the one that blessed us with the job. He didn't let the job close down yesterday, amen, or someone uh, uh, wreak havoc such as uh, uh, a type of Bernie Madoff type situation where all this that we saved up and prepared is gone. Saints, so many things can go on. We have to be diligent and do our part, but our ultimate dependency is faith in our Father. Amen. He loves us. So one of the things that can contribute to little faith is an underdeveloped relationship with God, an underdeveloped knowledge of him as our Father and caretaker, an underdeveloped understanding of the depth and breadth and width and richness of his love and care for us. That will contribute to little faith. Oh God, help us today. Wow. Glory to God. What else? Oh glory, we could just sit on that for a while. But here's another one, uh, a thing that can 
uh, cause us to walk in little faith where we should be elsewhere. And we find this in the Matthew passage. I'll read that, uh, 14 verse 31. And it says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. This particular story is that of the Lord uh, Jesus coming to the disciples, right, in the middle of the night. And um, Peter seeing the Lord, at first they thought he was a spirit, they didn't recognize the Lord. And we talked about that in a previous lesson, amen? Trouble can cause us not to recognize Jesus. Jesus is coming. But we're so disturbed by the storm and the trouble, we don't recognize the sea. Lord, don't let that be. We want to recognize you. They didn't recognize him. And then Jesus said, don't fear, it's I. And so then Peter said, bid me come. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. And that's a whole uh, discussion of itself. Amen. Some say Peter shouldn't have gotten out of the boat. Well, if Jesus didn't want him to get out, he could have said, Peter, wait there. I'll be there. He didn't have to say come. He could have uh, when uh, Peter began to sink and, and Peter reached out and said, Lord, save me. Jesus could have said, this is why you shouldn't have gotten out of the boat. When Jesus does say Peter and they're getting in the boat, Jesus could have said, Peter, you never should have gotten out. Jesus didn't say that. Instead, he said, why did you doubt? Because the reason he walked in the first place is because he believed. But he stopped walking when he took his eyes off of Christ and allowed the fear of his circumstance to overtake him. But before he took his eyes off of Christ and before fear came in, he was walking by faith on the word of Jesus that said, come. Hmm. So Jesus doesn't, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, chastise Peter by getting out. His question instead is, why did you doubt? Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Well, if Peter had little faith, does that mean that the other disciples had no faith? The scripture didn't go into that. But we know this. When we are faced with a circumstance that requires a miracle. Some things in life, you know, you know, what happened. But there are some things that come up in our life. If God doesn't work a miracle, hallelujah. Natural means not going to take you there. If God doesn't divinely intervene, if the hand of God doesn't make itself known in my circumstance, this thing is going to go awry. I'm standing in need of a miracle. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This passage lets us know that Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Meaning the two of them were together. He doubted because his faith was little. It wasn't zero. It wasn't a no faith. Not yet a great faith. But with a little faith, let him go a little ways. Great faith would have let you go further. So Jesus says, why did you doubt? Doubt came in and doubt overthrew his faith because the faith was little. If the faith had been stronger, more powerful, doubt would not have been able to overthrow it. Jesus is teaching us here, my Lord, my Lord. We must grow in our faith so that doubt has a lot more work to do. <laughs> Doubt's not going to be nearly as successful as it's been in the past as our faith grows. Doubt's got more to work against. It gets more and more difficult for doubt to overthrow our confidence in God as our faith grows. Oh, Lord, help us today. And this is where we begin to live, believing God, even though it seems impossible. This is where the impossible becomes possible because we believe and wait on and expect and look to and believe for the impossible. Sometimes God does things in our life sovereignly. It happens just by his sovereign will. Other things, if we believe for it, God will do it. If we don't believe for it, that particular thing, God may never do. But some things we know from scripture, when they exercise that great faith, the Lord responded. Are you with me? Lord, help us today. So we want doubt to have a hard time doing anything in our life because our faith has risen and we're no longer with little faith. Amen. You know, a bully has a hard time uh, uh, against a grown man, 
but that bully might have no trouble at all with a four or five year old. We don't want our faith to continuously be like an elementary, like a five year old. We want our faith to come to maturity where the bully called doubt gonna have a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, bless his name. Father, we bless you. Help us today. Amen. Anybody want to join me and wave and tell God thank you. Hallelujah. All right, our lesson today. Our lesson is a conquering faith. A conquering faith. Wow. That's the kind of faith we want. First John chapter 4. And we know the book of First John, amen, is one of three uh, in a series, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, books written by the apostle, amen, who is the brother of James and the son of Zebedee. And this is the prophet. This is, that uh, we'll certainly God use it prophetically, but this is the apostle, amen, who is close to the Lord Jesus. We know there at the uh, uh, Lord's uh, Supper or uh, when the Lord established our Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, at the time that they were celebrating Passover, the Lord established this. Uh, John was there and leaned on the Lord's bosom, amen, uh, close and loved the Lord. And uh, we know that he was part of the inner circle of Jesus, Peter, James, and John. We know that actually this uh, same John wrote a total of five books in the Bible, not only 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, but wrote the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. Amen. And uh, the Lord certainly used him in a mighty way. And here in the book of 1st John, it's often called the love book because it speaks much about love, our love for one another and the love of God. And this lesson is no exception, dealing with love, but it also is dealing with faith. Praise God. And so verses 2 and 3, and then verses 13 through 17. I'll be reading in the uh, King James Version. Verse 2 says, Hereby uh, know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Verse 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And it is the spirit of Antichrist, amen, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now is already in the world. This is dealing with the spirit of Antichrist. Now, he starts out giving us this, this clarity because some people were acknowledging that indeed Jesus Christ, the man Jesus from Nazareth, he is the Christ, the anointed one. And so he is God in human flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. He is the incarnation. God coming into carn. Carnal refers to flesh. God came into a flesh body. Amen. And so the Lord Jesus is the God man. <laughs> so those that deny that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh that spirit is anti, it's against Christ. The spirits that acknowledge, amen, the spirit that acknowledges that indeed Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that is the true spirit of the Lord. Now, this is important because it had already been prophesied that that spirit would come, that spirit that is against Christ. And he's saying that spirit is already in the world. There are already those giving this false doctrine, teaching this um, as a, uh, uh, something that would overthrow the faith of believers, uh, particularly uh, young or immature believers, and sometimes more mature believers not being established as they should, amen, might be brought into question. But he's saying that's an antichrist spirit that says that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. He has already come. Now he's already ascended back to heaven. Many of the persons that were uh, present on earth during those days. The Lord Jesus stayed on earth 40 days after his resurrection. Seen of 500, 500 brethren at one time and seen of many other people. There were many post-resurrection appearances of the Lord. He made it known, amen. Saw the disciples themselves multiple times and was seen by many others, hundreds of others to give an absolute assurance. Jesus of Nazareth, he rose from the dead. And of course the church um, uh, began to grow as people knowing with certainty he has risen from the dead. Amen. Now, so he lays out that because, of course, our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That he did come in the flesh, that he is God with us. He is Emmanuel. Oh, bless his name. And uh, we praise God for that. Now, uh, and of course, if Jesus isn't uh, God in human flesh, then his death is just the death of another man. And we're I have faith in, in that for nothing, but because he's God. 
Amen. And God sent a son and died in our behalf. Now we have salvation. Amen. Our faith is inextricably connected to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and his deity that he's God. So he's God and the resurrection. Those are two keys. There are other keys as well. He's virgin born and so on. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us. And, and let me mention this. The book of John is known for many um, verses that let us know the criteria. If you believe this, if you are this, if this marks your life, this is genuine Christianity. This is genuine faith. If you don't, you've rejected this and so on and so forth. You don't know him. That's not genuine Christianity. So it's a very potent book. And here he goes on in verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Oh, glory to God. The Lord dwells in us. Oh, how wonderful that is by his spirit. 14. And we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son. Oh, yes, he did. Anybody out there can be a witness. Wave at me. Oh, yeah, the Father sent the Son <laughs> to be the Savior of the world. And we're glad about it. Glory to God. 15, whosoever, now here come one of these criteria, confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God, right? So the opposite would be true. Those that deny, denounce, reject, amen, that... Uh, uh, deny or reject that Jesus is the son of God, God's not dwelling in them. They've not been born again. And in fact, the, one of the scriptures says, no man can say that Jesus is the Christ except by the spirit of God. The spirit of God has to give our spirit revelation. It's got to turn the light on and reveal to us that Jesus is the son of God. That's the work of the spirit of God in our life as the preacher, the teacher, the, 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 the witness, the, the person that testifies, we testify the gospel. The Spirit of God uses that word to convict and convert and transform hearts. Amen. So we're workers together, the scripture says, with him. We testify the gospel, preach, teach, sing it, write it in a book, sing a song about it, do whatever, get the word out. And the Spirit of God acts on that word in the hearts of people. It's very important. So whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in the Lord. Amen? How beautiful. But look at 16. This is our uh, keynote verse. And we have known and believed, right, the love that God has to us. Oh, we've known and believed the love God has toward us. God is love. Oh, bless his name. We're talking about pure, perfect love. Not the love, love, love that people talk about in society now, which sometimes isn't real love at all. But the real love, God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Here's another one. These dwell. To dwell is to live a place. So when God lives in us, his love lives in us, and we live in God and live in the love of God, that's genuine Christianity. If there's no love, there's no dwelling of God there because God is love. People who are marked by hate and their life is just propelled and filled with hate, they don't know him. Praise God. Either they don't know him or their brand new believer in the spirit of God has just started working on them or they are amongst the church but not a part of the body. Amen. Hate is not a characteristic of of the Spirit of God. Spirit of God is love. Amen. Glory to God. And hate expresses itself in many ways. Hallelujah. But love, love, love. Dwelling in us. God dwelling in us. We dwelling in God. We dwelling in God's love. That's genuine Christianity. Lord help us today. Look at 17. Herein is our love made perfect. Here's our love uh, brought to maturity and completion that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Our boldness in the day of judgment, meaning we'll be confident when we come before God in that great day, because the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart. Oh, this that's the sign. That's over in Romans chapter five, amen? Uh, hope maketh not ashamed, and the love of God is shed abroad, spread abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. We have confidence. 
when God has transformed us and the love of God is just permeating our heart and our life, he's changing our attitude, he's changing our goals, our purposes, love is flowing through us, whereas before it was hate and selfishness and contention and war and chaos, now the love of God flowing, oh, that's the work of the Spirit. And he says we can have boldness toward the day of judgment. We know God has done a work in us. Amen. Oh, bless his name. Here it is our love made perfect and brought to maturity that we have boldness in that day of judgment, knowing love of God is at work in us. Oh, Lord, have your way, Jesus. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. It says, for whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Wow. God's children, those are the ones been born of God. They overcome the world, the ways of the world, the mindset, the attitudes, the approaches, amen, the priorities, the methods, and the, the mannerisms of the world, the way the world lives that's full of hate and selfishness, and violence, destruction, loving sin, not only sinning, but loving sin, all that, the ways of the world. Whoever's born of God overcomes, has victory over those things. How? Look what it says. What to be born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. Oh, we're back to faith. Well, saints, we've got to grow in our faith. We've been talking about this in these lessons for months. Lord, let the word all oh, just take control in our soul. Bubble up. Overflow. Praise God. Our faith gives us over the world. My God. And uh, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes Jesus is the son of God, which takes us back to when the lesson opened saying, those that confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's the spirit of the Lord. Those that deny that, don't confess he came in the flesh, that's not of God. Knowing who Jesus is, that's the essential thing. Knowing and receiving and standing on with certainty that Jesus Christ he is the Son of God. Amen. That is the essential element. And that that knowledge, not just head knowledge, but the Spirit of God giving that revelatory truth that settles in our spirit. Man, that gives us a faith that overcomes the world. This is important. It's not in our lesson, but 1 John 2, 15 through 17 talks about love, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. It's not of the Father. It's of the world, right? So if we love those things, then the Bible says the love of the Father is not in us. As the love of God is in our heart and transforming us, it separates us out because it causes us to have a whole different attitude, mindset, perfect direction based upon the spirit of the living God, whereas the world is directed by the spirit of the evil one. The two are against each other. They're opposites. Amen. We love the people. God so loved the world. St. John 3 said, so loved the world. Talking about the people. But this is not talking about the people. This is talking about the way of the world and its mindsets. That's why, darlings, the church is not called to be worldly like the world. The church is called to be a city, Jesus said. And the Sermon on the Mount, the church is like a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Jesus says, you're the light of the world. The world's not to be our light so that we follow them. We're to be the light of the world. The world sees us and follow us because the world's in darkness. So the church is to be the light of the world like a city that's set on a hill, can't be hid. Oh, glory to God. Can't you see the picture? A brightly shining city up on a hill. Those in darkness now can see the light. Glory to God. Help us, Lord. Father, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. We magnify you. Thank you for your son, what he's done. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your spirit that works on the inward part. Transform us, Lord. Make us what we need to be. If there's anyone under the sound of our voice, if there's anyone... You've not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can do it right here, right now, wherever you are in the world. You can right now say, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died for my sin and was buried but rose again and he's alive. I reject my old life. I take Jesus. I'm going to follow him. 
And Lord, wash me, save me, make me new. All oh, glory to God. He'll forgive you. He'll save you right now. Hallelujah. You can begin a new life in him. Join a Bible-believing, preaching, teaching church. Amen. A Christian church to learn the ways of the Lord. Amen. Father, we bless you and we praise you. Now bless everyone on the sound of our voice. Bless all our brothers and sisters and friends everywhere. Give us strength and help us to live according to your word. And help us to walk in a conquering faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And until next time, remember this, the God of the Bible is real. Please prepare for your divine appointment with him. God bless you. Until next time.